This episode of the Northern Miner Podcast is brought to you by Revival Gold and their Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Idaho. If you want to learn more about Revival Gold, you can find them at revival-gold.com and you can find them on the TSX Venture Exchange at RVG and on the over the counter markets at RVLGF. So gold finally joins the party, breaks $1,800. Looks like we have a bit of a breakout in the precious metals. Welcome everyone, one and all, to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and it is wonderful to have you here again. The weather in Berlin, we are we were at plus 31 yesterday, plus 27. It's going to drop back down, but man, was that a relief after a freezing spring. So. We are in good tidings here, and the commodity markets, I mean, the Fed has to be worried. The Fed has to be worried because, as you're going to see in our commodity price update, things look a little out of control. Uh, John Cumming, our former editor-in-chief, sent me this chart of timber, and timber has gone basically parabolic. People have been talking about timber for a while, but the latest, wow, at least what I saw in that chart. So... The Fed must be worried, and I guess that's why Janet Yellen came out, the Treasury Secretary, and said we might have to think about starting to consider, or something to that effect, a raising rates, because if they lose hold of this thing, if they lose hold of this thing, like, I mean, as gold people, and this is a bit of a gold show, I'll let you know, this is for all the gold people out there, we have a great show with we're going in depth with Mark Bristow's Barrick conference call. But back to what we're talking about, we have a lot of gold people here and we've been subject to this hyperinflation narrative for going on. I've only been in this business since 2010, paying attention to it. Uh, maybe 2009, after the financial crisis, I sort of became interested when I realized the import of financial markets. I used to be into politics. Then I realized that finance is more important than politics. As I like to say, politics is the window dressing of economics. But back to our point, uh, we have been subject to this narrative of hyperinflation and gold and why we need to have gold because the dollar is going to be worth nothing. But we look at ways that could actually happen is inflation, right? And inflation has been a nothing burger going near a decade. So now we're seeming to get real inflation. And I always think about Jeffrey Christian, that question I had for Jeffrey Christian, which I'm still, I think I'm going to ask that question every single time I interview him, which is what's the relationship between commodities and inflation? And he seemed to suggest that a lot of uh, anticipation of an inflation is what led to the rise in commodity prices that in a sense it was investors who are raising commodity prices. But as he said, like it's not like one causes the other. It's they're kind of mutually related. That's what I gathered from what he said. So, which is why it's never quite clear. But clearly, what we do know is prices for basic materials are going higher. And so that is making things interesting in the mining industry. So, Therefore, you may want to register for the Global Mining Symposium, which is May 19th and 20th. It's amazing how these dates just come right up. I mean, that's like a week and two days away, astonishingly. And we have some great speakers as usual. So if you want to register, just go to events.northernminer.com and you'll get a nice welcome message from Anthony Vaccaro, Northern Miner Group Publisher. So yeah, so what's really cool about this one is we have a lot of digital people. I mean, it is led by David Garofalo, who is chairman and CEO of Gold Royalty now. I think he was at Gold Corp for a while. And then before that, I do know he was at HUD Bay. To me, what's most exciting actually is all these digital guys. We have the head of digital transformation at Valet. Like, like that guy sounds like he's going to have something to say on where this industry is going. Anthony Down, we also have the CTO 
of Newmont, Chief Technology Officer Dean Guerin. So that also sounds super interesting. And we have Ken Hoffman from McKinsey and Company, who is a senior expert and many, many more. If you're into golf, there's a closing presentation and there was going to be a virtual swing into spring. So if you're a bit of a golfer, you may want to check that out as well. And you can also register for free for that. So this is all free. Countdown clock says eight days, eight hours, 13 minutes and three seconds away. And final housekeeping, you can now submit nominations for the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. And we have a story on this on northernminer.com. And it says that we are now accepting nominations for individuals who have demonstrated leadership and outstanding achievement in the mining industry. And we have a quote from Pierre Graton, chair of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame and president and CEO of the Mining Association of Canada. And he says, quote, Canada's mining industry is essential and plays a key role in driving our economy forward while also being recognized as a global leader in sustainable practices. Our sector delivers the critical materials and metals needed for technology that will enable the global transition toward a lower carbon future. And it is important that we recognize the leaders that have contributed so much to its success. And if you want to learn more, just go to miningholloffame.ca slash nominate. That's miningholloffame.ca slash nominate. So yes, we have a very cool show by the end of it. I mean, it's a little long, this conference call. It's about half an hour, but if you stick with it, and Mark Bristow is a pretty entertaining speaker, if you stick with it, you're going to be one of the most informed people about the gold industry, I would maintain. So think of it as like a bit of a lecture. So, you know, lectures, it's not like you're watching Netflix here, but he's very engaging. And overall, once you're on the other side of this thing, this conference call, you are going to be very informed. So that's what we like to do here. So if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. Find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available including SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, we have a bit of a speech from Anglo-American CEO Mark Kudafani, and he was at CIM 2021. He had a few interesting things to say about the mining industry, so I thought we could start with that. This is by Alicia Hyatt from the Canadian Mining Journal. Tasked with talking about the role of mining in society as part of the opening plenary at this year's virtual CIM convention, Anglo-American Chief Executive Mark Kudafani didn't mince words. With a world population of 7.6 billion people that's growing towards 9 billion, quote, the simple fact is that the world cannot survive without mining and our contribution to literally every aspect of modern life. End quote. So this is becoming a, a bigger and bigger theme. I mean, it, it kind of always has been the theme, uh, the defense, the apology of the mining industry is that we are essential to everything that you do. So, you know, translation, and this is my interpretation, stop complaining. <laughs> so stop complaining. Uh, but, you know, let's not get into that because we know some of these complaints are valid. Continuing on, Kudafani noted that other critical sectors, including energy, food production, construction, transportation, renewable infrastructure, and communications, all rely on mining. Quote, in fact, 45% of the world's economic activity is driven by the mining sector. He said, end quote, I wonder what the oil industry, like they could probably say the same thing. I mean, continuing on, not only that, but compared to agriculture's footprint which takes up 50% of the world's habitable land, mining only takes up 0.04%. Oh, so agriculture, according to Mark Kudafani, takes up 50% of the world's habitable land. That is something to think about. I suppose once you get on a plane, though, it kind of all makes sense. I mean, what do you see? You see a bunch of farming, for the most part, and forests. Continuing on, that is, quote, literally the smallest footprint, 0.04%, relative to our economic contribution than any other industry. 
end quote. However, there remains a gulf between the public perception of mining and the reality of mining. Continuing on, quote, even with all the contributions we make, people tend to see us as an industry that takes more than it gives. One of the things we don't do well as an industry is talk about what we do. Yeah, this is also increasingly, like, people have been saying this for a couple of years now. And, and you know, as this response to a lot of the criticism that mining has received in the last decade or so, and, and even before. Now, again, some of this is deserved. I mean, our next story is on Rio Tinto, former CEO. So that always has to be kept in mind. This isn't a black or white issue. It's not like, oh, go team. Yeah, he's telling him like it is. It's like, this, is a, this isn't black or white. So let's not oversimplify. But he is right that the mining industry needs to do a better job of talking about what they do and that really they are, they are essential. Continuing on, quote, when we talk about life of mine plans, we're also now starting to focus on life of community plans and how we can create a hundred years future for those communities based on the infrastructure that we can bring as part of our mine development, end quote. Now, you are going to see this in spades in Mark Bristow's Q1 conference call. So you can see, like, what's great about what we're doing here today is we are informing you on what's going on in the top CEOs of this industry, what's going on in their mind and what they're concerned about. And they're concerned about the communities. And that is the new reality on the ground. You heard it a couple of weeks ago with Jack Lundeen. Continuing on, Quote, we understand the impact of technology and future of work will have. So we understand that we have to be a catalyst in those local communities for new jobs. Again, Bristow also emphasizes this, as you'll hear. And he also talked about the climate and sustainability. Quote, 10 years ago, we used to define ourselves as a mining company. And for most, that created an image of a company digging holes. In 2018... We redefined our own conversation about ourselves and took the way our customers were describing us, and that is as a metals and minerals company. So the change is from a mining company to a metals and minerals company. Interesting. And he continues about 10 to 20 years in the future, he sees Anglo becoming, quote, a material solutions company, end quote. We've heard this before. So just recently in a story, so this is all getting very, very interesting. The mining industry is starting to redefine itself. I mean, they don't have a choice about it. I think it's smart. A material solutions company. I mean, it's a bit rhetorical. We would say prolix. It's a little wordy. It seems a little excessive because, you know, ultimately maybe you just want to say what it is, which is you're a mining company. But you see the role, as, as we become increasingly digital here, you see the role, uh, everything's becoming about information and perception and about narrative. And it always has been, but it's becoming increasingly so as everything is mediated through the screen, a medium. And, and so everything comes to us as a story, and it always has, but now it's just, I don't want to say it's everything, but it's almost everything how your story is promoted and perceived. It's almost everything. It's like the simulation is happening, you know, where the, the narrative is more important than the reality. Now, this isn't entirely true, but it's increasingly true. Okay, so continuing on, quote, we need to help people understand what we do and how critical we are. We need to be a partner in society in creating a new future. We are the key to decarbonization and creating a long-term sustainable planet. And he also urged miners, quote, to take the time to understand our role in society, make sure we're creating the future and we're not becoming a victim of the future. So very interesting stuff. We are storytellers at the end of the day, and the mining industry has gotten the memo that it needs to change its story, and it really has over the last, I'd say, three years. Since about 2018, it's gotten the memo and it's started. So very interesting comments from Anglo-American CEO Mark Kudafani. Moving on, 
a little bit of balance here. Rio Tinto shareholders reject former CEO's exit package. So you will remember former Rio Tinto chief executive Jean-Sébastien Jacques, who was ousted over the destruction of the sacred rock shelters in Western Australia last year. And he had a pretty generous exit package. Let's look at it. Now, more than 60% of the votes cast on May 6th at the company's annual meeting in London and Sydney were against the remuneration report, which showed Jack received 7.2 million pounds, about $10 million US in 2020, 20% more than a year earlier. The sum was the highest earnings of his tenure, even with a bonus worth about 2.7 million pounds or $3.8 million. Jack was denied as a punishment. So he was denied $3.8 million, but he still had the highest earnings that he had had yet. In addition, the former CEO was allowed to keep shares awarded under a long-term incentive package worth an estimated $38 million US. Wow. Well, I mean, I think it does start to become a contractual legal issue. If you agree to give someone something and even no matter what happens, they get that thing, then it's pretty hard to reverse that. And it looks like this is more symbolic than anything. The revolt on pay, though significant, is more of a statement than a verdict as resolutions put before shareholders are advisory and not binding. In Australia, however, if a remuneration report draws more than 25% opposition for two years, the board in question has to put itself up for re-election. Interesting. And the company said, quote, the board acknowledges that the executive pay outcomes in relation to the tragic events at Juke and Gorge are sensitive and contentious issues. You know, this board, we acknowledge that this is a sensitive and contentious issue. That doesn't cut it. This board has problems. Okay? We acknowledge that this is a sensitive issue. That says, I have no moral spine. Okay, I have no opinion on this. We understand that you're concerned. That is an outrage, what they've said here. And I hope they do replace that board. Uh, You know, all they have to say is what happened there was unacceptable. And then we totally understand what people are talking about. You don't just say, we understand that you're concerned. That is what led to this whole thing, that kind of mentality. Op-ed over. And so is this story. Next. So we have a few stories here, so I'm going to go over them a little quickly here. Kyrgyzstan to temporarily take over Sentara's Kumtor mine. So the lawmakers in Kyrgyzstan have passed a law allowing the state to temporarily seize Sentara Gold's Kumtor gold mine, the largest gold operation in the country. The bill passed late on May 6th allows the government to run Kumtor for up to three months. It's based on the belief the operation may pose dangers to locals and the environment. Canada's Sentara said in a statement that Kumtor, which allows for a fifth of the former Soviet country's total industrial output, adheres to international environmental standards. It also said it, quote, believes strongly, end quote, the claims against it are without merit. And we have a comment from Dalton Barreto of Canaccord Genuity, quote, we are not surprised. We have been anticipating something like this since President Japarov took power on January 10th. However, the speed and breadth of these reforms has caught us off guard. We believe this opens the door to what is likely going to be a multi-year degradation of the relationship with the Kyrgyz state. And while CG, Sentara Gold, will leverage all available avenues of international trade disputes, we believe these are unlikely to be effective in the long term. Mr. Japarov has made no secret of wanting to align himself with Russia and China at the expense of Western relationships. And we believe there is a reasonable high probability that Kumtor could be a casualty of this geopolitical paradigm shift. Nonetheless, we do not believe this is imminent, but rather will likely take years to play out if it happens. A little bit of drama. That's, that's what's interesting about the mining world is you kind of get early signs of what's happening geopolitically sometimes. And we want to point you to the story by our new reporter, Henry Lazenby. He did an interview with Randy Smallwood on the state of streaming deals, and it's a very interesting article. And it sounds that Randy Smallwood feels like it's uh, excellent times in the streaming world. Uh, Quote, we've had some great success over the last six months with three transactions. I'm excited about a couple of more deals down the pipe here pretty soon. The opportunity set is bigger than it's ever been. 
And Henry Lazenby writes, given the firm price run for most commodities in recent months and the record copper price of recent weeks, Smallwood says the base metals industry has, quote, truly awakened, end quote, from a decade-long slumber. And a quote from Randy Smallwood, all of a sudden we've seen a wake-up in terms of those base metal prices. There hasn't been a lot of reinvestment into that space. This new price regime is all of a sudden driving serious interest in heavy investments back into the base metal space. And so, yeah, read the whole article in detail. It's a very nice opener from Henry Lazenby, new reporter at the Northern Miner. I just met him yesterday. Seems like a great guy. Continuing on, the Macquarie Group said it wants to exit cold by 2024, and they're based in Australia. So just want to touch on that. Uh, so it's getting harder and harder to support these coal projects from, a, from investment pressure. Another interesting thing in the couple of stories from the uranium sector, Cameco shares surge despite posting Q1 loss. So again, this disparity between the uranium price and uranium stocks continues. And this is a theme we've been talking about for a couple of months now. This idea that the stocks are ahead of the metal price of uranium. So we see more evidence of that with these Cameco earnings. I guess investors like what they heard there. And Denison Mines has bid for JCU Canada Exploration. And that is so that they can fully own the Wheeler River project. So JCU Canada Exploration owns 10% and Denison Mines owns 90% of Wheeler River. So they just want to consolidate that from the sounds of it. And finally, we have a interesting report on the... International Energy Agency saying that the metals price rally could hamper the switch to green energy. And this is by Cecilia Jamazmi, mining.com. Soaring metal prices may be good for miners, but they risk the ongoing transition to clean energy as batteries, solar panels, wind turbines with considerable needs for copper, nickel, cobalt, and lithium are required for manufacturing. According to the International Energy Agency, reaching the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement would result in a quadrupling mineral demand by 2040. Yet a lack of investment in new mines could substantially raise the cost of clean energy technologies. Quote, the data shows a looming mismatch between the world's strengthened climate ambitions and the availability of critical minerals that are essential to realizing those ambitions, said IEA chief Fatih Birol in the report. Continuing, quote, left unaddressed, these potential vulnerabilities could make global progress towards a clean energy future slower and more costly and therefore hamper international efforts to tackle climate change. So another interesting component here, I mean, you could argue the environment is becoming one of the biggest issues in the mining industry and metal prices are right at the heart of that. So sometimes people feel like this is a marginalized industry, but really, when you really think about it, we're right at the center. With that, those are your news stories. Now let's take a look at metal prices. We'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on May 11th, gold is trading at $1,836.61 per ounce. That is $50 higher than last week's quote. Silver is also trading higher at $27.34 per ounce. That is 53 cents higher than last week. Platinum is trading at $1,249.30 per ounce. That is $3 lower than last week. Palladium is also trading a little bit lower at $2,962.60 per ounce. That is $14 lower. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading at $4.70 per pound. That is 19 cents higher than last week. Aluminum is also trading at the highest we've seen it since we started recording almost two years ago with these metal prices at $1.14 per pound. That is 3 cents higher. 
Lead is also five cents higher at a dollar one per pound. Nickel is at eight dollars and eighteen cents per pound. That is twenty-five cents higher than last week. Tin is at fifteen dollars and twenty-two cents per pound. That is sixty-two cents higher than last week. Cobalt is unchanged at twenty dollars and fifty cents per pound. Zinc is at a dollar thirty-five per pound. That is three cents higher. So what do we see? I see up, up, and away. That's what I see. I see a breakout in gold and silver. Platinum and palladium, which had already had some pretty substantial moves, were cooling off a little bit. And industrial metals charged to new highs is what's going on here. And they're all in lockstep. I mean, 10 at 1522. You can go through each and every one of these and just go, oh, that's amazing. Copper, $4.70 per pound. So things are coming to a head for the Fed. And those are your metal prices. Coming up, we have the Barrick Gold conference call for Q1 featuring CEO Mark Bristow. And this is a really cool contrast with last week's Agnico show with Sean Boyd because you really see the difference between a 5 million ounce producer like Barrick and a 2 million ounce producer. I mean, it's a little long in the middle when Mark Bristow is going through each of the operations, but I left it in because I just think one, you, for you to understand the scale of Barrick's global operation, again, this is the second biggest gold miner behind Newmont. This will really help you understand that. So I hope you enjoy it, and I will see you on the other side. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning and good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Barrick's quarter one results presentation. What a wild past 12 months it has been. You will recall it was Q1 2020 when we held our first all virtual results presentation exactly a year ago. When we announced the merger between Barrick and Rangol back in September 2018, we said that its rationale was to combine the industry's best assets with its best managers to build its most valued gold business. It was and remains our long-term strategy, but in a relatively short period of time, as I'll show you today again, we have also achieved a long list of established accomplishments. Most recently, in a quarter still heavily impacted by COVID-19, we met our production guidance, maintained strong free cash flow, and increased our net cash by $500 million, in spite of an advanced tax payment of $72 million to the state of Nevada. The quarterly dividend has been increased threefold since the merger announcement. And this year will be topped by a 70, 750 million return of capital distribution, more than doubling the payout for the year on a per share basis. Exploration, refocused and stepped up since the merger, is pumping exciting prospects into our pipeline from multiple targets across the group and major growth projects such as the Pueblo Viejo expansion and the third shaft at Turquoise Ridge are making good progress. And at Pogra, we are on track to resume operations later this year, following our binding framework agreement with the government of Papua New Guinea. I refer you to this cautionary statement which is also available on our website should anyone wish to study it in more detail. Our business, our businesses have over a long period of time earned their social license to operate and this has served us well at a time when ESG has become a key investment criterion. In our sustainability report for 2019, 
we published the industry's first ESG scorecard, rating ourselves against our peers and the requirements of the GRI Sustainability Reporting Standards. The Sustainability Report for 2020, released a few weeks ago, and which now also reflects the checklist of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, shows that we have made progress against almost all key ESG metrics. We have also advanced our admission reduction target from 10% to 30% by 2030, with the ultimate aim of achieving net zero by 2050. The principles behind ESG have long been practiced by Barrick's two legacy companies and are deeply embedded in our every facet of our business. We believe that a good company should also be a good neighbor, which is why we invest heavily in community development projects guided by the fully functional community development committees we now have at all our minds. We also prioritize local employment. Last year, 97% of our workforce were host country nationals, and we give a preference to local contractors and suppliers with whom we spent more than $4 billion in 2020. We take great care to manage and minimize our environmental impacts, and all our operational sites have now been certified to the ISO 14001 Global Best Practice Standard. Still on the social and governance front, we are addressing the checkered human rights history of our Tanzanian mines through audits and training conducted by external experts. These are the highlights from the 2020 Sustainability Report. It's a core barrack philosophy that the benefits created by our operations should be shared equitably with all stakeholders, particularly our host countries and communities who are the owners of the resources we mine. As we have already seen in Tanzania and Papua New Guinea, governments of developing countries are demanding a bigger slice of ownership. Barrick's answer to this is to work to increase the size of the pie, benefiting all. Our sharp focus on safety continued to drive performance improvement, and our total recordable injury rate was again reduced. Latin America has done particularly well on the safety front, but North America and Africa and the Middle East still have some work to do. A number of our mines have already received their ISO 45001 certification, and the rest are on track to achieve this compliance by the end of this year. We're also not easing up on our COVID controls, and we've already started vaccinating the workforces at Nevada Gold Mines, Pueblo Viejo, and Jabal Said. A group-wide vaccination plan is currently in the works. There were zero highly high severity environmental incidents in the group last year or during quarter one of this year. We are particularly proud of our water recycling and reuse programs, which in the first quarter of 2021 achieved an 84% efficiency rate ahead of our 80% target. Carbon emissions continued to decrease in line with plan, and we've been extending our environmental reach into the wilderness areas of our African host countries, where some important natural assets are under threat. In terms of a recent agreement with the government of Mali, we are assisting with the rehabilitation of the neglected FINA Reserve, a UNESCO biosphere site. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, we support the Garumba National Park, home to the country's largest elephant population, as well as the critically, 
critically endangered Cordofan giraffe. As part of our support, we sponsor an elephant tracking program, and since 20, September 2019, no incidents of elephant poaching have been recorded, which is a significant achievement in this part of the world. These are the highlights of the quarter. Our Tier 1 assets again produced solid performances with leading margins getting us off to a strong start to the year and putting us on track to achieve our annual production target. A particularly notable feature was the 31% increase in copper revenues due to higher copper prices with continued strict control, cost control. As guided, the quarter one results were softer for a range of operational region, reasons, but we are forecasting a much stronger second half, driven by mine sequencing and planned maintenance at Nevada gold mines. The commissioning of a new leach pad valley at Valadera, the ramp up of underground operations at Bullion Hulu, and higher grades forecast for Lemoana. The strong free cash flow and the increase in net cash are the highlights of the quarter. The sustainable quarterly dividend, coupled with the 750 million return of capital, represent an industry-leading return to our shareholders. An average lower gold price, which was $100 per ounce less than in the previous quarter, did, however, impact revenue, but the copper operations benefited from a much higher copper price. Over now to operations, and we begin with the North American region, which is off to a good start to the year and on track to meet its annual guidance of 2.3 to 2.45 million ounces of gold on an attributable basis. Nevada is Barrick's value foundation, with three of our Tier 1 mines, leading margins, a strong operating cash flow, and a solid net cash position. The joint venture has a good grip on its geological inventory, with the Brownfields and Greenfields exploration programs up and running and already paying dividends. Nevada is probably the world's most prospective gold district, and major opportunities are taking shape around our core sites at Carlin, Cortez, and Turquoise Ridge. The potential to grow resources and add value from this asset base is very significant. Production at our North American flagship Carlin mine was down because higher carbonaceous ore had to be blended with lower grade stockpile feed, which affected roaster feed grade. Costs were nevertheless well contained. Both Carlin roasters will be shut down for their annual maintenance during the second quarter, that's this quarter, and that's partially why we are forecasting a better second half performance. At Carlin, we are looking to extend the known ore, ore body deposits. Work on the North Carlin trend is targeting high value breccia bodies open at depth with a view to enhancing the life of mine as well as making new discoveries. Leval continues to yield robust high grade results and recently identified controls are opening up new peripheral targets. Two emerging high-grade zones have been identified within a broad mineralized horizon. Evaluation of the northern Leval area's full potential has been accelerated and resource conversion is in progress. We expect a maiden resource for the year end and are confident that it will continue to grow. We now move to Cortez, where production was impacted by resequencing as a result of a previously reported geotechnical event, 
which delayed stacking at the heap leach pad and affected the feed blend to the oxide mill. The mine expects a stronger second half of the year thanks to a higher contribution of fresh ore from pipeline as mining there ramps up. At Robertson in the Cortez district, we are also converting improved geological knowledge into growth opportunities. Step out drilling 300 meters beyond the existing resource blocks suggests there's considerable near surface upside that could lead to additional discoveries and validates my personal belief of the potential of this area. We're also looking at pipeline, an old tier one asset immediately adjacent to Robinson, which could provide a significant addition to Cortez's life of mine. And at Gold Rush, the exploration declines have now intersected the ore body with positive results. Development is accessing ore for the initial bulk metallurgical campaigns and heading north towards, towards the first vent shaft position. We're considering whether to access four mile from surface or by, sorry, we're considering whether to assess four mile from surface or by underground from Gold Rush, which is our preferred option. Four mile, based on what we know, provides real potential to add to Gold Rush's value in many ways. Not least of all, Four Mile is a higher grade resource, and with its inclusion, it centers the main access development, allowing better utilization of the invested capital. At Turquoise Ridge, we had a better quarter with steady production and slightly better grades from the Twin Creeks open pit. Total cash costs were well within guidance. Construction of the third shaft, de-bottlenecks, the hoisting and ventilation constraints, which will allow for higher underground production. And it remains within budget, that's the turquoise number, uh, uh, the, twin, uh, the uh, number three shaft, it remains within budget and on schedule for commissioning in late 2022. We have at Turquoise Ridge made considerable geological progress. Improved understanding of the controls of mineralization has provided a solid foundation for mine design and planning and has indicated a significant potential for a new high-grade underground operation. If as anticipated, Turquoise Ridge and Twin Creeks are proved to be geologically connected, it could add significant high-quality answers to this uh, complex. And still in Nevada, production at Phoenix was consistent with the previous quarter and costs were significantly lower due to increased copper byproduct credits. And I would just point out that um, it's only at Phoenix where we uh, allocate credits for the copper back to the uh, uh, all-in sustaining uh, cost per ounce of gold. With total cash costs of $79 per ounce for the quarter, um, Long Canyon continued to boast some of the best margins in the industry. Long Canyon's mine life extension project is being reviewed as we shared with you last quarter. And we are planning now, having reviewed it, to restart the permitting process for phase two. Further north in Canada, Hemlo had a challenging quarter as it continues to transition to an underground only operation with the closure of the open pit in late 2020. Strong production is expected in the second half of the year and the mine remains on track to meet its annual guidance. And meanwhile, we continue to position Hemlo as a potential tier two asset. Mining from its new portal is expected to begin in the latter half of 2021, and this will provide a third mining front and increasing flexibility to the mine. 
at Hemlo, the geologists have done a great job and the identification of significant new extensions outside the mine plan is expected to speed up its journey to tier two status. So back to the United States, where our Donlin joint venture with Nova Gold in Alaska has con commenced its 2021 drill program of 20,000 meters. This program is aimed at testing the updated geological model and ore controls, and to obtain additional geotechnical and geometallurgical data. This will support the completion of the updated geological resource and genetic models, after which we will decide on the next steps in this project's progression. And so now we move to move south to our Latin American and Asia Pacific region, where we continued to in intensify our focus on generative exploration and new business. The region also houses two of our key projects, Pueblo Viejo's plant and tailings expansion and Valadera's transition to a new heap leach facility. We are guiding annual attributable production of 600 to 660,000 ounces. And for this moment, we also not including a pogra in this guidance. Pueblo Viejo is processing lower grades in line with plan as it advances development of its plant and tailings expansion project. As you know, uh, last quarter, we um, repositioned um, Tongan to extend its life by reducing its throughput, and the quarter one results reflect that transition. We're also looking at supporting the mine life extension through Brownfield's exploration on satellite target. As this map shows, the exploration team has identified a number of these targets, each with the potential of increasing Tongan's life of mine. And what's important is quite a few of these priority targets are within 10 kilometers of the Tongan mill. Now across to East Africa, where Kabali's Q1 production remained in line with plan as it keeps on track to achieve its annual guidance. Recently, a new government has taken office in the DRC, and we spent some time with this, the new government appointees, the new cabinet appointees, just 10 days ago, and engaging with them. And, uh, and we have always had, as you know, a strong relationship with the Congolese government. And, uh, and, and I think now, after seven months of really no uh, real cabinet uh, to speak of, we now have a fully um, uh, appointed and uh, responsible and countable cabinet uh, supported by both the parliamentary and uh, Senate majorities. And, uh, and we are confident that, that we will be able to address uh, some of the outstanding issues that have been on the table for some time now including uh, the movement, the free movement of cash from the country. At Kabali, our reserve replacement program targeting a third successive year of growth continues with quite some success. Drilling on the world-class KCD ore body has confirmed alteration and mineralization over 500 meters downplunge of previous drilling and the existing resource limits on all loads and KCD is all about these cigars that plunge down um, and they have a high level a high um, number of ounces per vertical meter because of their grade this work supports the extension of the KCD system and bodes very well for our ability to continue replacing depletion at Kibali for the foreseeable future. 
Likewise, expiration along the KZ trend has delivered a number of open pits, which will increase flexibility at the mainly underground Kabali by balancing the ore feed with more open pitable material. The expiration pipeline at Kabali continues to grow, and it is currently led by uh, the Kalimva target. Moving further east now uh, to Tanzania and North Mara, where North Mara had a good quarter on the back of improved underground productivity and higher grades. We still have some work to do on the plant upgrade, and our exploration team is looking at building up the life of mine. Continued work on the Gokona system is indicating potential lateral and down-dip extensions to the ore bodies, which could provide substantial resource, gro resource growth to extend the life of the North Mara mine. And the ramp-up of the underground mining and processing operations at Bullion Hulu is making very good progress towards achieving steady-state production. The drill program in the high-grade Deep West Zone continues to produce positive results. So a little bit about our copper production. Copper has been one of the top com performing commodities over the past 12 months, with the me metal recently breaching $10,000 per tonne for the first time in over 10 years. The fundamentals for co co copper remain strong, and as you know, I've spoken about copper uh, for the last two years. And we see our own copper portfolio as a source of differentiation to our gold industry peers, providing shareholders with meaningful exposure from assets that are in production today. Based on the current spot pricing, copper is expected to represent at least 20% of our gold equivalent ounces sold from 2021 to 2025, up from the 16% contribution in 2020 based on actual realized prices. As already referred to, Barrick's copper portfolio performed well on the back of higher copper prices. Lemoyne's production was impacted by lower grades, but is expected to improve in the second half of the year. Jabal Saeed continues to deliver a consistent performance, and drilling is on track to extend its life of mine once again. And at Zeldivar, the operation is progressing its Cupraclaw project and is still managing the impacts of the COVID pandemic in Chile. Um, we've recently focused in on some of the exploration near mine and adjacent exploration potential at Jabal Said. And uh, recently we had um, some wide and high grade intercepts well outside the known ore body. Um, and these intercepts are expected to add to, as I indicated earlier, the previously extended life of mine. And you can see them on these sections um, on the slide. So, as I said at the outset, Barrick's core belief is that the best assets managed by the best people will deliver the best results. Our management team's record, our management team's record speaks for itself. And as far as assets are concerned, Barrick's majority owned and operated five of, operates five of the world's 10 largest gold mines, with a sixth in the form of Turquoise Ridge, a close 11th. Our strategy is to concentrate on Tier 1 and Tier 2 mines, and we have refined our portfolio accordingly through the disposal of non-core assets in a process 
which has already realized one and a half billion dollars and is still continuing most recently through the sale of Lagunas Norte in Peru and some smaller legacy sites. Each of our core mines has a high confidence 10-year plan in place. And I would point out those are plans, not forecasts. And Nevada Gold Mines, in fact, is looking beyond that. The rise in the gold price has prompted a resurgence, in my opinion, of the short-termism which plagues and has plagued the market with investors going for short-term gains rather than sustainable growth. Here at Barrick, it's all about building a business for owners, and our focus is firmly on the future and on the creation and delivery of long-term value to all our shareholders as well as all our other stakeholders. Our foundational objective is to build a business capable of delivering the industry's best returns. Over two years on, we've made considerable progress towards that goal. The dividend has tripled, and we are now proposing to more than double that with a return of capital in 2021. Cash flows have increased to record levels, and a once crippling debt burden has been reversed. These achievements are being built on a foundation of a great asset base, a fit-for-purpose structure, and a lean and agile leadership who have more than lived up to our best people mantra. We've certainly had our fair share of challenges, no doubt, and then some, but we've overcome them and will continue to do that, I promise you. So, looking ahead, our exploration teams are on the search for new opportunities to grow our sustainable, profitable strategy. And we're more than ready to continue to explore the openings that will be offered by the da dynamics of our gold industry. Congratulations to everybody that made it to the end of that call. I hope you feel informed because I think you are. I think you are extra informed. I feel like I should be awarding small certificates for people that have made it through the end of today's lecture. So thank you once again for joining us. It's a pleasure to host this podcast for you each and every week. And if you want to help out the podcast, just leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Send it to your friends. Until next week, take care. This episode of the Northern Miner Podcast is brought to you by Revival Gold and their Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Idaho. If you want to learn more about Revival Gold, you can find them at revival-gold.com and you can find them on the TSX Venture Exchange at RVG and on the over-the-counter markets at RVLGF.